Welcome to the show. Let's try this. Let's try to have a very demure, a very mindful conversation about Georgia. We're not going to use slurs. We're not going to make accusations. We're not going to anger anybody. I'm just going to tell you, hopefully without people flipping out at me, what's going on in Georgia and how this might affect the election. Nothing I am about to say is meant to demoralize or dissuade anyone from voting, but to point to what may be an outcome we don't want and then to think about what we could do to prevent that outcome. Here is what's taking place in Georgia. No matter which polls you look at, no matter which polling average you look at, Donald Trump appears to be clearly leading in Georgia, a state that he lost in 2020. Every individual poll recently has Trump leading Georgia. It's not an outlier right wing poll. It's every poll. In fact, the headline that got a lot of attention this morning was that in one particular poll, the Atlanta Journal Constitutional Constitution poll of Georgia, Trump was plus four. And that is indeed the case. A reasonable response would be, OK, well, Trump's winning that poll. But what about other polls? And indeed, when we start looking at the different averages, you see that in the real clear politics average in Georgia, it's red all the way down. It's insider advantage. It's Quinnipiac. It's the Hill. It's the Atlanta Journal Constitution. The right leaning Trafalgar Group poll actually gives Trump the smallest lead of these polls. And you have to go all the way back to September to get a Wall Street Journal poll that has Harris winning. By the way, the Wall Street Journal polls increasingly in many states seem to be the outliers. If you don't look at the Wall Street Journal poll, you're all the way back to mid September for a poll that has Kamala Harris uh, leading Trump on average now leading by 2.5, 2.5 in Georgia. Even if we look at the 538 polling average, which I know some in my audience prefer, you see that they also have Trump ahead, not by 2.5, but rather by 1.5. Uh, why does Georgia matter? Why do we care about Georgia? Well, by itself, maybe we don't care about Georgia. If we look at the map from 2020 and you just flip Georgia from blue to red with its 16 electoral votes, it doesn't change the outcome. If Kamala Harris loses Georgia to Trump, but everything else remains the same, she's fine. She wins not by as big a margin as Joe Biden won electorally but she wins with 287 electoral votes, 17 more than the 270 that you need. The issue, of course, is that if Trump does win Georgia by two or two and a half, you have to wonder what else falls. Trump's lead currently in Arizona is close to two. And if you flip Arizona and Georgia, Kamala Harris still wins. That's the good news but she is left with only a six electoral vote margin of breathing room that starts to get pretty close. Now, I'm not ready to flip Nevada. Trump's lead in Nevada is less than one. I'm not ready to flip Wisconsin. Trump's leading by only 0.4 there in Michigan. However, Trump is leading by 1.2. And as you can see, if you flip Michigan, it's over and Trump wins. Democrats know this. Democrats are very active in Michigan, and hopefully that doesn't happen. In Pennsylvania, Trump is leading by less than one. He's leading, but by less than one. I'm certainly not ready to flip it. So the point here is Georgia flipping. If you assume Arizona flips does not mean that Kamala Harris loses this election, but it leaves no margin for losing just about anything else. I mean, again, in, in the scenario where Arizona and Georgia flip, that's the scenario on the screen. Even if Trump does get New Hampshire, which he probably won't, but even if he did, because that's only four electoral votes, Kamala Harris still wins. But if any one of the other critical states falls, Pennsylvania, for example, that would not be good. Um, uh, certainly, 
If you look at Michigan, that would not be good. Wisconsin, that would not be good. All of those scenarios are very bad. The only exception would be Kamala Harris can afford to lose Nevada in this scenario. She would still win, but with exactly the 270 electoral votes that she would need. So what does this mean? This means we must activate in Georgia phone bank door knock. What about donating? You know, I I hate the system we have. I really do. So I always feel a little weird about saying donate, donate. I've never made a political donation in my life. I've chosen that my activism far more than I can do with money. I can do through the show. So to go out and say donate money, it's the system we have. The candidate that raises more money tends to win. But given what's going on and 40 percent of the country being unable to afford an unexpected four hundred dollar expense, it would feel a little weird to come on here and say donate, donate money to Kamala. But certainly that is a tool that is in the playbook. But phone banking, door knocking, participating and get out the vote, all critically important. And we must discuss now as we look at the map. Again, I, I, I don't want to anger anybody, but you're not children. I mean, there's some children in the audience, but most of my audience is adults. I don't want to anger anybody. But what is the, the, the way the ship is being oriented right now is towards a smaller margin of victory for Kamala Harris than Joe Biden had in 2020. If Kamala Harris is to win most, if I were a betting man and I'm not, I would bet that her margin of victory is smaller than Biden's. These smaller margins of victory, 282 electoral votes, 287, 276, maybe even exactly 270 if Harris loses Georgia, Arizona and Nevada, which she may. These extraordinarily slim margins of victory are far more likely to result in the V word that we've been dreading now for years, violence. And I want to talk about that next. Listening to my show is great. If you want more great coverage straight from the source reported by world class journalists, subscribe to The Washington Post, one of today's sponsors. When you go to WashingtonPost.com slash Pacman, my listeners get an exclusive deal to subscribe to The Washington Post for just 50 cents a week for your first year. I read The Washington Post constantly. It's an invaluable resource for preparing the show. And with a Washington Post subscription, you can actually listen to any Washington Post article in addition to reading them so you can tackle your to do list and catch up on the news at the same time. If you're in a rush and need to catch up quickly on the day's most important and interesting stories, the Post's newsletter called The Seven is a quick commute read sent each weekday morning, also available as a podcast. The election is rapidly approaching. Now is the time to sign up for The Washington Post. Go to WashingtonPost.com slash Pacman to subscribe for just 50 cents a week for your first year. That's 80 percent off their typical offer. Truly a steal. And the link is in the description. 